I'm Pastor Case. If you're visiting, glad you're here. We're in a study in the Gospel of Mark, and uh, Jesus is now on his road uh, to Jerusalem to go do the unthinkable, to die for an ungrateful creation. And so we're going to learn about what that looks like and how we can learn from the many things that he puts in this important chapter. And uh, I'll pray, and then we'll set the stage and then listen. Lord Jesus, help us to listen to your word, to let it transform us in the way in which we live. Father, I know that there are so many students and leaders here that genuinely love you and seek to be faithful to you. I know that there are some here today that might be here simply because they've been invited and we're glad that they're here. But there might be some here that are here reluctantly because they've been told to be here. But Lord, I just pray that you meet each and every one of us where we are and that we come to have a humility and a teachability that allows us the privilege to be changed and changed in such a way that we love like you love us. And if that happens, Lord, we're going to live a life that's wealthy. But if it doesn't happen, we're going to live a life that's a waste of time because we're going to be selfish and we're going to do things that we were never designed to do. So help us in our arrogance and our pride to humble ourselves before you and truly be taught by your Holy Spirit in such a way that people see Jesus Christ in us. It's the greatest compliment anyone could be given. So help us to live that out in ways that glorify your name. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as you'll see in this section, um, there's essentially six areas that he addresses, and I'm going to highlight them very quickly for you after we listen to uh, the section read to us. But you're going to see a section on divorce. You're going to see a section on children. Then you're going to see a section on a rich young man. Then you're going to see Jesus predict his death for the fourth time. All this is in the cover page of your notes. And then you're going to see, uh, again, a uh, unusual request by James and John. They're still not learning um, what their lives are to be yet, okay? But to their credit, they eventually do learn what their lives are to be because these are the two individuals, as you'll have it read to you, that end up writing um, some key sections of Scripture, okay? Sections and whole books of Scripture that you would um, deeply love. This is the Apostle John who wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation, and James, obviously, uh, in the book of James. And then you see uh, at the close of this chapter, uh, blind Bartimaeus, he's being um, in some ways, he's physically blind, but ironically, he's the one who actually spiritually sees. So you're going to see the irony that Mark puts together in the bottom of this chapter, that the one who's physically blind is actually the only one maybe in the crowd who actually knows who Jesus is. They, he basically yells, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then what did the crowd do? Some of the crowd that were in opposition to Jesus probably, or some of the people that um, didn't quite understand all the things, they basically tell them to be quiet, which is what the culture does to us today, be quiet. And so there's this sense that you can listen to that or you can just keep living the life that God calls you to do. And Bartimaeus did that. He's like, you know what? Forget all you. I'm just going to keep shouting because I'm the one who's blind. I want to see. And so he ends up shouting, and then Jesus and he have an interaction um, together where Jesus does what he does so many times. How can I help you? And then he's specific, and Jesus does heal him um, by faith. And so the, the reality of this section is such that people are continuing to try and trick Jesus. The Pharisees are going to ask him a, a trick question, and the purpose of the trick question is because this is what caused John the Baptist to be beheaded. Okay? Um, this is when John the Baptist basically called Herod an adulterer. And so in the sequence of that, as you remember earlier in the gospel, Herodias didn't qu quite like that. So she tells, his, she tells her daughter to request John the Baptist's head on a platter. And he ends up getting beheaded for his faith and trust. And so the sequence of this, the Pharisees are trying to set Jesus up to have a trick uh, question. And Jesus wisely answers, as you're going to see in just a moment. Okay? But we're going to talk a little bit about the key details of each of these sections in a very condensed way so that you get plenty of time in D groups to talk about it. Okay? So you're going to see divorce, you're going to see little children, you're going to see a rich young man, Jesus predicting his death, the request of James and John, and a blind man, Bartimaeus, receiving his sight. When you're done um, having this read to you, we'll give you a little quiet time to look through the notes a little bit, but then I'm going to highlight some key things um, before you go to your D groups. So enjoy Mark chapter 10. Mark 10. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? 
What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. They were on their way up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. <clears throat> you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, 
and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road.
So we'll take the first section. First section you'll see in 1 through 12. Um, the people, are, again, are trying to trick Jesus. You'll see um, in verse 1, they were in the region of Judea and are across uh, the Jordan. Large crowds of people uh, came to him, as was the custom. They kept following him in large groups. I put under 1.1 under verse 1. There's a sequence, and so you'll see this map. Um, you'll see certain things in this map. Basically, here's Jerusalem, okay? And you'll see that Jesus is going to be making this travel um, through a number of these cities that I've realized you guys can't see where you're at, but he's in Capernaum, kind of going through all of these different areas to make his last run through the different groups of people that he's been loving and trying to teach the truth, okay? So what ends up happening, you get to verse two, Pharisees came and tested him, and by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? So they're trying to trick him. It's a double-edged question, okay? And you guys live in a world where um, divorce seems to be pretty commonplace. God never designed it that way. It says in the book of Malachi, he hates divorce. One of the reasons he hates divorce is it's a broken promise. One of the other reasons he hates divorce is it does this. This is your first fill in the blank. Um, divorce divides. God seeks to unite us. So divorce divides in such a way that it causes a lot of difficulty in life in a way that God never intended for a family to experience. Some of you are probably experiencing some of that within your family, and I hurt for you, and so do your parents uh, in various ways. But one of the reasons that my wife and I have a passion for youth ministry is we want to help you set you up to win in such a way that you can actually be intentional and prayerful about that big decision that you're yet to make so that you understand that decision for what it is, and it's a lifelong commitment. Lifelong commitment that you promise and covenant before God, family, and friends that you will love your spouse all the days of your life until the day the Lord calls you home. It's one of the beauties of marriage when it's done biblically and done the way that God wants. So what you see here is you see in verse 3, what did Moses command you? Jesus did what he's done several times when people are trying to trick him. He flipped the question on them. He's not in the hot seat. They are. I'll remind you again when it comes to apologetics and people grill you on stuff. Don't let them just sit and grill you with questions. Ask them questions. You've already dealt with life's greatest question if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, okay? So Jesus does this, and basically, he says, what did Moses command you? He replied, then verse four, they said, Moses permitted a, a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. I put some stuff here in your notes. Essentially, they made divorce fairly easy, and ladies, you'll like, um, you won't like this entirely, but um, back then, women were viewed as property, so women really didn't have the privilege to divorce a man. The man had the power to do that. The women didn't technically have the power to do that. And so the reality of it is they're trying to trick him and all these things. And Jesus doesn't buy into any of it. Look what he says in verse four or verse five. He says, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. And what does Jesus do? He goes pre-Moses. And he can do it in a way no one else can because he was there at the creation. Okay, Jesus understands where this originally started, the way God designed marriage to be. So he says in verse six, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they will no longer be two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. This is why premarital sex is so dangerous. The text says a marriage is consummated when a man and a woman come together essentially sexually. Now you're, a bo you're bonded in such a way that it's different than any other relationship you have. Which is why biblically you want to go into marriage as a virgin. I know it's not popular in your world, but it's God's version of success. When you mess with that, you cause a lot of difficulty in your future commitment in marriage you, generally speaking, will have intimacy issues in your marriage, sexually speaking. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that happens that you think, oh, it won't happen. It does happen. I've done a lot of counseling with a lot of people. It's dangerous. So when you get to the core of Christian commitments, the way that God designed family, like we just talked about Wednesday, and the way God designed marriage, as he's doing it here biblically, you have a responsibility to follow his his line for success, as faithfully as you possibly can, okay? Because this is what Jesus is saying. Hey, it's not up for discussion ultimately the way God designed it. Because he wants you not to be divided. He wants to be, have you be united. 
What woman doesn't want to know that she can completely trust her husband? And what man doesn't want to know that he can completely trust his wife? When that happens in the dance of marriage, the whole marriage gets stronger. And guess what also gets gets stronger? The family. The kids don't have to worry about coming in the door wondering when there's going to be a note on on the table saying, dad left or mom left. Chose to broke the promise. God is not a fan of divorce. It divides. Be clear. Malachi, very clear. So I'm trying to be crystal clear with you before you make that decision. I've told you 100 times, if not 1,000. Every single day you breathe, you should be praying for your future spouse right now. I prayed for Debbie long before I knew her. You should be doing the same. It is the second biggest important decision you will ever make. It's the second biggest decision you'll ever make. So Jesus lays it down. I put some stuff here in your notes. It's really important because essentially the reason, one of the number one reasons for divorce is selfishness. You will find out pretty quickly when you're in marriage how selfish you become. You'll find out pretty quickly when you have children how selfish you are. And it trains you. That's why finding a Christ-centered man and a Christ-centered woman is so critical in a marriage because you're finding a person who's already learned how to be selfless. Who's already learned what it is to serve. And saying to selfishness on a daily basis, I need this part of me to die. Because this part of me only causes division and difficulty. So this is not a light topic. They try to trick him and Jesus preaches the scripture. And he does it so masterfully as you and I could all know. Okay, verse 11, he says, he answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. Verse 12, and if she divorces her husband and, um, and marries another man, she also commits adultery. Adultery is, is obviously not something God is in favor of. We read that in the book of Exodus. And so I've given you some stuff at the bottom of page 73 that talks about women were treated as property. So this is an important topic. It's not a light one, okay? So don't forget, Divorce divides. God wants to unite. That's why a Christ-centered marriage should be a very successful marriage because you're recognizing what the Savior wants you to do to lay down your life like he did for you and lay down your life for your spouse. And you love them and you love them and you serve them. That is what a strong marriage, that's what a strong family will always be according to God's word. Get to the second part, the little children and Jesus. Now you gotta understand the context. Women had very little property or power in that time in history. Children had even less, by far, okay? We live in a culture that's very different from the culture that we're reading from. We live in a culture where kids are almost worshipped to the extent that kids are worshipped to such a level in in specialized sports and specialized areas of school and all these things that it's caused a lot of divorces because of it. I know it factually. I could give you many people I have known that have basically put their kids on this unbelievable pedestal and they, they, they worship their kids. They focus on their kids so much. That's upside down. And what ends up happening is the kids start telling the parents and the family what they should do. Well, who are you tell me? What? Oh, oh, by the way, I'm your parent who provides everything for you. I have quite a bit of authority over you. And so this dynamic that in which you see is so messed up the kids are here and parents are somewhere here like almost coddling to their kids and say, well, I hope they like me. I hope they like me. That's not parenting. This is parenting. You're above your kids. You brought your kids into the world and you lay down your life for your kids. You love your kids, but you do that in such a way that they desire to please you. They desire to be appreciated by you because you actually lead your home. Okay. You actually lead your home. And so this illustration that Jesus gives, he rebukes the disciples. Okay, check the text. It says in verse 13, people were bringing little children to Jesus to have them touch them, by the, but the disciples rebuked them. This is an unbelievable illustration. It's a very quick one, but it's a powerful one. And here's why it's powerful. Verse 14, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant, meaning he was upset. He was frustrated that they didn't understand what he had been doing in their, in their ministry together. He says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Verse 15, I tell you the truth, anyone who receives the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So if you don't receive the kingdom of God like a little child, Jesus is saying it won't work. 
And here's why I think he says that, okay? I put some stuff in your notes under 1.4 under verse 14. You can look at that. Um, one is he talks about children's humility, talks about children's obedience, children's trust, and children have short-term memory. There's a section in here that I meant to put in your notes that I have in some of my other notes. I'm gonna give it to you really quickly right now. One of the reasons I think he uses the illustration of children is they're typically um, very humble, very teachable. Children are always typically easy. Uh, they, they love to learn. So you'll find out pretty quickly when you're a parent how many times your kids are going to ask, hey, dad, hey, mom, could I, could I, could I, and they ask a thousand questions. They're always eager to learn. But here's one of the other reasons I think it's powerful that he gives the illustration to children. If you've ever babysat or one, been around little kids, you leave the room for a second, and all of a sudden you, you discover not only are they not where they're supposed to be, they're like on top of the fridge. They've scaled the counter. They've scaled beyond the counter to the fridge because they want the cookies that you put up here that they thought, you thought they couldn't get. Okay? And you're like, oh, I hope the parents that I'm babysitting these kids for don't come home right now because I'm in trouble, right? Here's one of the beauties of kids. They're climbers. They don't look at things like adults. When you get to be an adult, you're like, oh, that's just, that's just so hard. That's going to be exhausting to climb and get those cookies. A kid doesn't think that way. Kid's like, I got that counter. I'm going to climb the counter. And after I get the counter, if I get to this, I can get up to on top of the fridge. They're climbers. They don't look at, at, at obstacles the same way. Children are beautiful that way. But when you become more civilized, you look at things, you're like, oh, that's just too much work. So number one, I think kids, the illustration is powerful. Kids are climbers. Secondly, kids are persevering. They don't give up. When they fall down, if you ever watch a little baby, I've been blessed to be around babies almost my entire life. It's been awesome. And when they first get up to walk, you see them and they like, they walk in such a way that they pound the earth to see if it's still there, right? So they sit here and they go like this. And then when they fall, they're wearing diapers so it doesn't hurt their butt as much, but they fall down. And what do they do? They get right back up. It's unbelievable when you watch little babies and you watch kids. They get right back up. They're persevering. Where adults, as they get more sophisticated, they're like, oh, it's just so hard. I want to get up. It's just exhausting, okay? So the illustration Jesus gives is really kind of cool because he's like, hey, let these kids come to me because they just trust me. They're going to follow me by faith. They're going to climb what I tell them to climb. They're going to persevere like I ask them to persevere. And then the other thing that's really cool about kids, watch them. They're incredibly joyful. They don't need a lot of stuff to have fun. They're joyful. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to go on an international mission trip this last year, and who knows, I hope we can go this year, but I've been in certain parts of the world where kids only have one red ball. That's the only toy they have. And you would think that like, they have the entire toy division behind them, the way they react. They're just so joyful. So there's a joy to kids that's so powerful. And lastly, one of the most powerful things about children is when they're really little, ask any parent, they're like, constantly asking, mommy, can I help? Daddy, can I help? Can I help? Can I help? Can I help? And sometimes as a parent, it's not helpful to have them help because you want the recipe to work, right? If you're cooking something or if you're building something, you don't want it to be like, well, we, we, he helped here, okay? And it's now crooked, all right? But they want to help. But as you get a little older, you're like, you know, I don't want to help. I want to finish this game. I want to do this. But little children, no, no. Little children, they climb, they persevere, they're joyful, and they look for ways to help. I think it's one of the reasons Jesus does this really quick little sermonette on let the little children come to me because if you don't become childlike, you'll never be kingdom-minded, okay? Which is your second fill in the blank. Childlike faith is kingdom-like faith. So Jesus is laying out this groundwork. He's laying it out in such a way that you and I can be more mindful of this idea. <clears throat> and here's the key, key part as you write that down, okay, for those of you who are. Jesus makes a very important clarification to be childlike, not childish. Okay? And I've seen many alumni come up out of this ministry, and I'm so blessed to see them when I see them. And one of the things that they say to me when they come back is they see what I have said to them for years, that the land of stupid is alive and well on college campuses. As soon as people get a sliver of freedom, they go live in the land of stupid. They get drunk, they sleep around, they do stuff that's completely out of a sinful bent, and yet they expect to have the success that obedience comes, comes by way of obedience. 
And so they do all this kind of stuff and it destroys their reputation and all these different things. And so what are, what are they? They're not childlike, they're childish. Ladies, don't marry a childish man. It will exhaust you. It will. Guaranteed. Out of all the marriage counseling that I've done, it will absolutely exhaust you if you marry a childish man. Do not do it. I don't care how cute and chiseled he is. Do not do it. Okay? Childlike, however, you want that type of man because he's going to be very good in caring for you and living by faith, but he's also going to be very good at caring for your kids because he'll have a playfulness to him, a fun factor to him that he's going to try and design the house that you live in, all these things in a fun factor. So this idea of being childish should be put to death in all of our lives. Childlike, by faith, is critical to being kingdom-minded in the way that God calls us to be persevering in life and the love that he has for us. So that's a key part. Go to page 75. Here's the part of this passage that's so critical. We could go through this in quite a bit of depth, but I'm not going to go through it. I want you to get some d-group time. You'll see a number of questions in this particular section of Scripture. You'll see in verse 17, good teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So that's the context of where we're talking about, okay? The context of it. And then he goes on and Jesus says in verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. So Jesus is not rebuking this guy in the way of condemnation. He looked at him in in a way of love, okay? And what does he say? He says, go sell everything that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Well, what does he say? Verse 22, this man, his face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, exclamation point. Now you understand in the context of their time in history, they thought the rich were loved by God because they were rich. Jesus is turning that upside down and saying, just because you're rich doesn't mean God has loved you. In fact, many ways, the more wealthy you are sometimes in this world, the less dependent you are on God because you think you're self-sustaining. None of us in this room, including myself, are self-sustaining. God could literally bring a snowstorm in the next week that just is relentless that would shut us completely down. We have no power. Go swim in the ocean. Go surf, go surf on the West Coast someday and actually go out into some big waves and tell me you have power when you come back in. I've gone surfing on the West Coast and I have been tossed around like a rag doll in some waves that are only 10 feet tall. Absolute rag doll. Have no power. Okay? So when you understand the context of this, that here's a man who has a lot of wealth Doesn't mean he can't be saved because he has a lot of wealth. But Jesus, in his humorous way, he gives, uh, I put some stuff in your notes here you can look at on your own. Go to page 76. He says this in a humorous way, verse 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So this put everybody up on edge because they're like, what in the world? What did Jesus do? This is a humorous statement, basically. He's saying he picks the largest animal in Palestine, a camel, And he picks the smallest thing. And you cannot have those two things work together. You know why? Because the point of this is this next section, verse 27. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So here's your third point. Your third point is salvation is impossible by yourself. But salvation is possible by way of the Savior. The context of this is critical. This is a salvation issue. Okay, this is probably, in my opinion, verse 27 is one of the most misquoted Bible verses on the planet. People will have this. I even have it in my own shop. Someone gave it to me. I'm grateful. But it's on fridges. It's on posters. It's on stickers. With man, this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God kind of thing. It's this idea that, you know what? With God, I could start a restaurant. With God, I could do this. With God, I can do anything. That's not the point of this passage. The point of this passage, Jesus just said it. A camel cannot go through an eye of a needle. You cannot save yourself. You cannot do it. And Jesus is making it crystal clear for anyone who wants an object lesson. See that camel? See this needle? Have the camel go through the eye of the needle. And everyone in the audience would be like, well, Jesus, you can't do that. And Jesus is like, well, that's exactly the point. You cannot save yourself. And so you go through all of these different things and all the struggles that we go through in life. This is the good news of the gospel. 
This should cause anyone who understands life to be celebrating because you and I have a GPA that you try to achieve in high school. And if you don't get the right GPA, you don't get to go to the certain universities you might like to or colleges you'd like to go to. Salvation isn't based on that. Salvation is simple. Even a child can understand it. In fact, little children often understand it quicker than adults because adults get too sophisticated again. And so the beauty of the gospel is a little child can understand it, but so can a 99-year-old person come to trust Christ as their Savior, even at the, at the brink of going home. And so the reality of your life and mine is this. Mark has been asking throughout the gospel, who is this? Who is this? Who is this? Jesus has done so many amazing things, it should cause all of us to make an answer. Who is it? Who is it for you? Who is he? Because if you think you're going to save yourself, even because you've been at the loft here for weeks on end, that's great. I'm glad you're here. But you still have to make a decision to trust Christ as your Savior. And if you don't do it, you're not saved. I know I'm married because on this left hand, I have a ring that I've committed to marrying my wife, Debbie, and to be with her for the rest of my life. I was there. Now, unless you wake up in Vegas and make a whole bunch of the foolish decisions and wake up and discover, did we get married last night? For most people, that wouldn't be wise. But the reality of marriage is such that you make a decision, you prepare for the day, you celebrate the day, you're married, and from that day on, the two become one. I also have on this hand, I'm doubly married. This is my, hand, my ring <coughs> that many of you get when we baptize you in the ministry. It says, he died for me, I live for him. It's a cool little fidget spinner, it spins on my ring. Okay? This reminds me on my right hand, because I'm right-handed, that everything that I do better reflect him well in the world, because I belong to him. So on this hand, I say I belong to my wife. I'm her husband. On this hand, I belong to the King of Kings. I need to seek, I need to seek him, live a life that's sanctified by him, so that people know I'm doubly married. And that freedom that comes from that is huge. That freedom of salvation, I can't save myself. Neither can you. That freedom gives you great wealth. And so Jesus closes this section in verse 23. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. I put some stuff in the bottom of your notes for that. The main reason for that is rich people, typically rich people, I know several rich people that have more money than I'll ever see, but they love the Lord and they are generous with the Lord's money because they know it's the Lord's money. They give. They're very generous. But a lot of rich people who have no interest in following the Lord because they think they'll be controlled by the Lord in such a way that they don't want, they tend to hoard their stuff. They do all this kind of stuff. And what's interesting is rich, rich people typically feel like they don't need God because they got all their needs met. Do you know there's people that country, the Americans used to send missionaries to certain countries. Those countries are now sending missionaries to the United States because we're so messed up when it comes to spiritual issues. We have, we have literally surrounded ourselves with idols so that we don't have to submit to the living God. The fourth point goes to this in this next section. He closed that section in verse 31. The, last, the first will be last and the last will be first. I put some stuff there. We're going to talk about that at the very end. Okay? This next section, uh, point four, salvation through surrender. He paid for you. It's verse 32 through 34. Jesus predicts his death. He does this for the fourth time. He does this in such a way that causes it should cause the disciples to recognize that true salvation comes through true surrender. And so Jesus is going to model this. We're going to talk about it in just a little bit in the next section, but I've given it to you in this bottom section of the notes. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give, you, give his life as a ransom for many. And so there's this idea that you and I have a responsibility to understand the cost of sacrifice that he did. I put some stuff in your notes in the middle of page 77 that talks about the greatness um, of sacrifice that he did, but also the cost of true greatness is generally humble, selfless, and uh, sacrificial service. There's a whole section there that John MacArthur wrote that is quite good. I'd encourage you to look at it, okay? So he goes through all of these different things. 
He goes through the, the fact that the rich cannot save themselves. That's a paradigm shift. Jesus, right after that, says, hey, guess what happens, guys? Verse 33, we're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will, um, will hand him over to the Gentiles. Verse 34, who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. So Jesus is calling his shot for the fourth time while he's going to Jerusalem. He's going through that whole map of people that he's walking through. He's being challenged by the, the powers of the day, the Pharisees, and he keeps turning the question back on them and brings them back to the dawn of creation, what marriage was actually designed to be and family was designed to be. He's teaching them that the people that they don't pay much attention to, children, are actually his object lesson for kingdom-minded living because of the way in which they live their life naturally, okay, and joyfully. And then he's bringing into fruition this idea that salvation is only going to be set for you to receive the Savior, who is going to go like this and say, I love you. And anyone who trusts in him will be saved. Those who say, eh. Guess what Jesus gets to say to them when they die and stand before him and everybody will give an account for their life. Jesus will be like, eh. He'll give you what you wanted. Here's, here, I've done funerals for people who went to hell. You want to talk about tricky? You want to talk about difficult? It's excruciating as a pastor. There's no hope. Jesus said hell is real. He just said it last week. We talked about it in Mark 9. So the reality of this decision is not a small decision. And so when you see all of this stuff go on, he's saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. And he's telling them, this is what's going to happen. Don't, don't grieve in the same way because on three days later, I will rise. And we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. You get to this last section here in, in point five. Salvation leads to servanthood. This is what we just talked about in Mark 10, 45. As he did for you, we're to model it. If you're a follower of Christ, you model that type of leadership. You serve. Yesterday was a great day because we had our serving Saturday for middle school and we loaded all the boxes that are going into the U-Haul. Aaron did a great job organizing all the stuff. And so here we have all these young middle school boys carrying these boxes to the truck. Some of these boxes carry more than they do and they're, they, they, they weigh more than they do and they're carrying them like this and they're going through all this stuff and they bring them. It was just kind of comical to watch them, but I was so proud of them because they're carrying these boxes that I know are going to bless a whole bunch of little kids that don't have Christmas like probably everybody in this room. And when you watch those videos, you see how excited they are to open a shoebox. Shoebox size of gifts. Where many of you will probably open a multitude of gifts. And so the reality of this, this sequence that we're going through in this, in this part of servanthood is Jesus is going to challenge James and John once again. I, I still can't believe we don't have time to get into this, but verse 35 says, Teacher, they said, what we, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. I can't even imagine asking that question to Jesus. But I'm not going to get in a debate with these two guys because they wrote some scriptures that have changed my life. So somewhere they learned how to do this. But in this section, I don't understand why they asked that question. I think that's a pretty bold question. As you know, Jesus is going to Jerusalem. Hey, hey we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Oh my goodness. I'd be like, if I was another disciple here, I'd be like, dude, time out. <laughs> you might want to rephrase that. Remember, this is the guy that calmed the wind and the waves on the, on the lake. Remember, this is the guy who just helped this person, this person, this person, this person. Shh. Don't ask him that question. And so here's what ends up happening. They basically, Jesus kindly says, what do you want me to do for you? Again, similar to last week's question, when they're arguing on the road, he said, hey, what were you arguing about? He knew what they're arguing about. He wanted them to say it out loud so they'd hear how stupid it was. Who's the greatest? That's what we were arguing about. Here he's asking again, what, what, we, what, what do you want? There's essentially another version of who's the greatest. So they haven't learned yet, okay? But they will learn eventually because John and James become huge um, influencers in the church, okay? And then Jesus basically says in verse 20, 38, can you drink the cup and be baptized in the baptism that I'm about to be baptized? Do you understand what I'm about to do for you? Do you understand what you're signing up for if you're going to follow me? It's this whole sequence. You go to the next page, <clears throat> verse page 78. They go through all of this stuff, and this is where you see, okay? 
You see in verse 43, it says, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be, his, be your servant. And this is where you see verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. This is Jesus' answer. Guys, you're not understanding. It's not my power to give you the opportunity to sit at my right and my left. Jesus knew that's the Father's call. Okay? But in the process of all this, he's saying, hey, you're missing it. You're missing it. I am going to lay down my life for you. And the word ransom, I put some stuff in your notes here. Ransom in the first century as a slave or a prisoner could gain freedom if a purchase price, a ransom, was paid. Essentially, if you didn't have someone pay you out of your slavery, you remained a slave the rest of your life. So in the first century, they understood what this meant, this verse, at a whole different level than we do. A ransom had someone on the outside had to pay to make you free. Does that sound like anything? Sounds like the gospel to me. And so Jesus is laying this out. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom to pay for you and for me. When you understand that, it changes how you love. But until you understand that, I don't think you have the slightest clue on what love is. Pastor Chip just preached on it. That's why, ladies, and that's why, gentlemen, I tell you, do not be unequally yoked. You want to marry a follower of Jesus Christ, someone who follows him with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and they demonstrate it by how well they love their neighbor as themselves. That's a marriage that will remain strong because they understand you're here to serve just like Christ came to serve us. You lay down your life. And you might not get always what you want. But this is, this is a gift that he gives you. And so it puts it out right here. It says, Jesus would pay the ransom for many by his death. And that's the question that Mark is basically laying out for the 100th time. He paid for you. What are you going to do with it? Who is this? Who is this for you? And so the beauty of the gospel is this, and it closes in this last section. Okay? Um, this last section, sixth point, is this. The salvation statement to truly see life is actually ironically seen by a blind man. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's how you become a Christian. You say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. Without you, I cannot save myself. But through you, I can be saved and freed of my sin. And I can go from being spiritually blind to spiritually seeing. I went from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. And it only happens when you say, I do. I do believe. It only happened when I said, I do promise and covenant to my bride, Debbie, that I actually became her husband. I said, I do. You have to say, I do to Jesus. And in as much as you say that, and you understand like Bartimaeus did, hey, Jesus, son of God, essentially is what he's saying, but son of David, the Messiah's title, have mercy on me. And so the irony of this is so powerful at the end of this section before I let you go. The blind man actually sees better than most of the people in the crowd. And what did, do, what did you see when you read, had it read to you? What did the crowd do? They told him to be quiet. And what does he do? He just keeps shouting, shouting all the louder. This is a powerful illustration. I put some stuff in your notes. on he's, he's the blind man who actually sees spiritually. And you see in the last part of your notes on page 79, Jesus stopped and called for him. And they basically, he says, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asks him the question. He says, Rabbi, I want to see. Verse 52, go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the long road. I've often want, Bartimaeus is one of the people I want to see in heaven. I've often longed to ask him the question, what was it like to not see and have the first person you see be your creator? And then not only that, watch him go on the road to Jerusalem to then die on the cross. Bartimaeus probably had a lens on that level of love that no one else on the planet had because he understood his title. He called him Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then he watched him ransom his life on the cross. I think Bartimaeus was probably like many other people, just weeping unbelievably because they felt so unworthy of that level of love, like I feel that unworthy. And it's not until you feel unworthy 
by his love and grace that you understand biblical Christianity. He ransomed his life, paid it, so that you are no longer a slave to sin. You're now free because of a Savior who says, follow me. That's why Mark's gospel is so powerful. He constantly puts the question back on the audience like I'm doing for you right now. I've answered this question by the grace of God. You have to answer it. There is no partial correct answer. You have to answer it. And I'll promise you this. You'll have all kinds of distractions that will try to keep you from answering it because that's how the enemy works. So part of your life is you getting to the point where you say, Lord, I want to understand. Teach me. Train me so that my life actually matters. And people would say something, not arrogantly, but they would say of you, like there's, where Mark is saying of Jesus throughout this book, that when people see your life, they constantly ask the question, who is this? I don't know many people who walk through school like that person does. I don't know many people who have the integrity that they seem to carry with them. doesn't mean you're not going to make a mistake, mistake but you, you carry the cross of Christ daily in such a way that people see Christ in you. They see that you are no longer a slave. They see you as living one who's free. That's how the gospel changes other people. When you become a disciple, you seek to disciple other people. That's the hope of the gospel. None of us can save ourselves. It's very clear in chapter 10, and it'll continue to be clear in the chapters that go. Let's pray. Father, help us. If there are people here today that have never trusted you to be their Savior, I pray that they would repent of their sin this day, whether it's now or later today. I pray that we would understand who this is that we've been talking about for the last several weeks. It's the promised one that you've said would come in the scriptures. It's the one who would do the unthinkable and ransom his life the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus, you were without sin, so you sacrificially spent your life on our behalf because we have much sin. And so, Father, we pray that if there are people here today that have never really said, I do, they maybe have been coming to church for potentially years, but until we say, I do, in marriage, we're never married. Until we say, I do, to you as our Savior, we're never truly in Christ. But I pray, Lord, that there are people here today that truly say, you know what, today's the day. November 15th, 2020, this year has been a complete wash, but it's not a complete wash if we have been washed of our sin and been set free because of the Savior. Father, I pray for those who've already trusted Him, pray that they'd grow in maturity, that they wouldn't be immature in their faith, that they would grow and be vibrant in their faith, and they would have childlike faith, continuing to be climbers, continue to be people who persevere, continuing to be joyful, and continue to find ways to serve. Father, if we can be that kind of people, not childish, but childlike, Jesus Christ will reign in our lives, reign in our marriages, reign in our families, and you will get much fruit from the life we live because we've been redeemed through your blood shed on the cross for us. Father, may we never take that love lightly. May it motivate every word we speak, everything that we do, so that your name is glorified. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen.